Thank you very much, Dr. Klinga. Uh, I'd like to thank you for inviting me here to speak today. This has been very inspirational, and um, it really wasn't fair for you to put me uh, after Steve, whose speech was just fantastic. Um, so I was asked to talk about artists and perspectives in disease with a focus on CSF disorders. And there are, of course, many different artists with many different viewpoints. And I can't speak for all artists, but I can share with you my own perspective and my own story. Everything starts from a dot, which is a variation of a journey of 10,000 miles begins with a single step. And don't worry, my talk won't be the equivalent of 10,000 miles. But I will start with some background about who I am and how I came to be here. When I was a kid trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, I dreamed about becoming an artist. I was always drawing and painting and making things, but I didn't have any role models in the arts. My father was an electrical engineer. My mother was an English teacher. We didn't have a lot of visual arts in our community or in my home. And although I loved making art, I didn't see artist as a viable career choice. But I also loved animals, and during high school, I volunteered at a riding stable, and I had dogs and cats as pets. And I observed the veterinarians who treated these animals, and I thought, this is something I would like to do, care for animals. So I majored in science in high school, and I volunteered with large and small animal vets as often as I could. Right after high school, I went to Penn State University. I studied biology and biochemistry, and then I did some graduate work at, in microbiology at the University of Pittsburgh while I was applying to veterinary schools. And this is where I met my husband. He saw some of my artwork, and he gave me the confidence to return to my original dream of being an artist. So I left veterinary medicine behind, and I followed him to Boston, where he was a medical student. And a few years later, I had earned a Master of Fine Arts in Sculpture from Boston University. Since then, I've continued to make art. I've worked in various science and medical labs and in hospital administration, and I'm a wife and mother. So fast forward to 2017, when the Art League of Rhode Island and the Warren Alpert Medical School at Brown University sent out a call for entries for artwork about medicine and science. Well, I had to apply to this. The art exhibit was the inspiration of Dr. Petra Klinga to complement the cerebrospinal fluid CSF disorder symposium that year. And the artwork they were asking for was to have a connection to CSF disorders in some way. There were no specific guidelines. But this pr perspective stated that only two-dimensional artwork would be accepted. Well, this was a little bit of a problem for me since most of my work is three-dimensional bronze sculptures. So I want to take a little detour here and introduce you to some of my other work. On the left is the Martin Richard Memorial at Bridgewater State University. Martin was eight years old when he became a victim at the Boston Marathon in 2013. He's holding a poster he'd made the previous year for a school project that reads, No More Hurting People, Peace. And this sculpture is a celebration of his life and that message. On the right is a women's rights activist and suffragist, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, at the Women's Rights National Historical Park in Seneca Falls, New York. And this is one of 20 life-size bronze sculptures located in the visitor center that I created in collaboration with two other artists. But of course, this artwork, or artwork like this, would not be acceptable for the exhibit that I was preparing for. So I had to take a step into the unknown and come up with something to submit to the CSF exhibit that would hang on a wall, that I could create and complete in a few weeks, that would have something to do with an area of medicine I didn't know anything about, and that would be of high enough quality that my professional artist colleagues would find compelling. Piece of cake. Actually, it was pretty daunting, and I wasn't sure I could do it. But I went back to my training in science, and I, I considered my materials and methods. And I chose to use a technique that I'd learned some years ago called paper casting. Paper casting involves making a sculpture in clay, and in this case, a relief. And then I make a plaster mold of the relief, and I allow it to dry completely. Then I get cotton fibers and water into a, and put them in a wearing blender and blend them up to create a, a wet pulp. Then I press that pulp into the dry plaster mold. The plaster pulls the water out of the pulp, and once the paper is completely dry, it release, releases from the mold, and I have a completed cast. 
So now that I had my materials and methods, what was I going to create that would express something about CSF disorders? And here's where I think art and medicine for me begin to merge. I created two artworks. One was a representation of the ventricles of the brain that you see here. These delicate structures make, circulate, and drain CSF throughout the brain and spinal column. And this gave me the opportunity to study the ventricles. I went to the most authoritative source I could think of, the internet, to learn what they do, what they look like, what can go wrong, and what happens when something goes wrong. I looked at pictures, I read about people who had CSF disorders, particularly normal pressure hydrocephalus. And this is when, as you know, the ventricles are blocked and the cerebrospinal fluid cannot drain properly. It causes them to swell and compress brain tissue against the skull. I read blogs written by people who had, who had this disorder. I watched videos. I tried to understand what the issues were, what the symptoms were. I listened to their concerns and I began to feel what they were going through. I immersed myself in the lives of these people. And here are examples of two patients who wrote about their experiences. I'm a 54-year-old male and have normal pressure hydrocephalus. My left side is getting weaker and I'm very clumsy, having suffered falls and the like. Walking is very difficult. And another patient wrote, the most annoying symptom was incontinence. When I drink a glass of water or coffee, within a few minutes it would pour out with no warning. Sometimes in the middle of a sentence during a normal conversation with a friend, my mind would simply stop and I couldn't finish what I was saying. I also had a symptom of falling and stumbling when I walked. The second artwork I created came to me very quickly and almost as an afterthought. I remember while I was working with the clay, I was thinking, this isn't going to be anything. Why am I even doing this? But it was a really a, a visceral reaction to all of the images and recordings of people I'd seen and heard. And I didn't think about it as much as I felt it. It really was an empathic experience. And I called this artwork Hakim's Triad, the name of the triad of symptoms that occur with normal pressure hydrocephalus, and I wrote this statement about it. Three unique symptoms known as Hakim's Triad affect a person's ability to walk, cause urinary incontinence, and memory loss. In this paper cast, the falling figure here, two small drops of paper, and the absence of color relate to these particular symptoms. So I entered both of these pieces into the exhibit. They were both accepted, and I won an award along with another very talented artist, Betsy Ritz, and you can see her piece there as well. I sold both of these pieces, and the buyer, as you know, was Dr. Klinga. Something about these artworks spoke to her, and recently she told me a story similar to what she related earlier. When patients have symptoms from normal pressure hydrocephalus, they might live for some time with these symptoms, particularly difficulty walking, which often leads to falls and subsequently a fear of falling. This fear embeds itself into their minds and emotional life, and when the symptoms are treated and no, and no longer present, are present, patients might still be reluctant to walk. The physician may not understand this irrational fear. The disorder's treated, you don't have the symptoms, what's the problem? The statement in Hakim's triad makes about falling, the visual effect of that image brought home the understanding that falling is a real fear, that it may not go away even though the symptoms are no longer present. <clears throat> the artwork communicates empathy for the patient's emotional state. So when a, a physician or any caretaker understands a patient on this level, and when a patient feels that they are understood, healing can happen. An artist is an observer and an interpreter. He or she observes the outer world and the inner world and then creates an image or a piece of music or a dance or a poem that expresses a feeling or a truth in a new way that provides both the artist and the art appreciator a deeper understanding. As an artist, I was able to observe and empathize with sufferers of CSF disorders. I had to look carefully, pay attention to details, really hear what was being said in order to truly understand something I did not personally experience. And these are practices that any caregiver, family member, nurse, therapist, physician can benefit from. We can all be artists. And by that I mean be careful observers and be open to the lives and experiences of others as well as our own. Creating art is an excellent way to practice empathy, express our own vision, and connect with other people. It can help us understand others and help us feel understood. So I join with the late Kurt Vonnegut who said, to practice any art, no matter how well or how badly, is a way to make your soul grow, so do it. Thank you.